The art world, where paintings change hands for fortune. Selling at $95 million. But for every known masterpiece, there may be another still waiting to be discovered. Well, that's it. Well, that's it, isn't it? That <laughs> is it. That is our painting. International art dealer Philip Mould and I have teamed up to hunt for lost works by great artists. We use old-fashioned detective work and state-of-the-art science to get to the truth. Science can enable us to see beyond the human eye. Ta-da! Oh, wow! The problem is, not every painting is quite what it seems. You successfully faked Larry's even while you were at school, didn't you? Yes. It's a journey that can end in joy. Oh, oh dear. Isn't that great? It's more wonderful. Or bitter disappointment. I can't cope with this roller coaster. What a nightmare. In this episode, we take on one of the 20th century's most important painters. Not number 31, the Lucian Freud. Madam, you have it at $50 million. Sold. Famed for his distinctive nudes, Lucian Freud was the most valuable living artist until his death in 2011. Could we have discovered a lost work, one of the first portraits Freud ever painted? It's a very mature-looking painting. It's got power and presence, and the market love him at the moment. But we're facing almost impossible odds because the artist himself denied ever painting it. Other experts believe that it is a Freud. Or even though Freud himself a lot of experts says it's not by exactly. him. When we're trying to prove an artist wrong, we need hard facts. It's possible that we could have embedded in this picture a piece of DNA, perhaps. <laughs> this is our most incredible challenge yet. Have I got it? I'm not joking. Yet. That's extraordinary. Disputing the word of Lucian Freud himself. We've yeah. not taken on a task like this before. There's no doubt that Lucian Freud was one of the most extraordinary characters of British art. I never think about technique um, uh, in anything. I think it's, um, it holds you up. You have to take paint on trust. Born in Germany in 1922, he was softly spoken but with an iron will. As his fame as an artist grew, he gained a reputation as a gambler, a Lothario the magnetic personality at the center of controversy and feuds. Yet he moved effortlessly between low and high society. He even painted the queen. But it was his work that obsessed him. Each painting could take thousands of hours, creating intensely observed portraits, sometimes beautiful, sometimes disturbing. At his death in 2011, he left an estate worth almost 100 million pounds. Freud is one of the most important figures in modern art, and we've been contacted by a man who believes he has one of the first portraits he ever painted. So we're going to go and see a man called John Turner, who says he's got a work by Lucien Freud. Does he? And the art market absolutely loves it. But from everything I've heard about Freud in the past, he's quite a tricky character, so I think we might have our work cut out. Oh, look, here we are. And there's John. John Turner has had a successful career in retail design, and before that, he trained at the Royal College of Art. He has an impressive collection of pictures. But one is particularly special. He inherited it and was told it was painted by Lucian Freud as a teenager in 1939. Well, it's, it's certainly a painting you, you notice, isn't it? It is. I mean, that's... I mean, I'm glad to see Fitz of Freud has got his clothes on. I was wondering what we were going to be presented <laughs> with. But it's got, um, it's got a real drama to it, hasn't it? Few of Freud's juvenile pieces ever appear on the market. It's unsigned, but if this really is by him, it could be a rare and valuable survivor. And have you, have you shown this to anybody? I've shown it to other experts, and interestingly, they have all immediately said this is a very interesting, very important picture by Freud until they spoke to Freud. Hang on, tell me more about that. 
1985, it was taken to Christie's, and Christie's initially said, yes, this is a Freud, and put it into the catalogue. And um, then they spoke to Lucien Freud himself, and he denied it. And these are the letters from Christie's. So Christie's accepted it as a genuine Freud, then they what, spoke to Freud? Yes. I sent a photograph of your painting attributed to Lucien Freud to the artist, and he's now replied, I'm afraid he says this is not one of his works. So what are we doing here? Other experts believe that it is a Freud. Oh, even though Freud himself a lot of experts says it's not by exactly. him. It's a pretty extraordinary challenge. If we take on this picture, we're taking on Lucien Freud himself. Yeah, it's obviously deeply annoying if the artist <laughs> If the artist himself has said it's not by him, but we're dealing with Lucian Freud, and he was he was a tricky, unpredictable man, and it's it's not necessarily the end of the story. The mystery surrounding this painting dates back to 1939, when Lucian, seen here with grandfather Sigmund and brother Stephen, arrived aged 16 to study at the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing. There, Freud is believed to have painted the portrait which somehow came into the hands of a fellow student, Dennis Worth Miller, the man who was to give John the painting. So how did you acquire this painting? And is there anything about the acquisition of it that gives a reason why Lucien Freud would turn it down? I was given it by an artist called Dennis Worth Miller, who was a student with Lucien Freud at the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing, very young, 18, 19, 20 and Freud was younger than Dennis, and they hated each other. They hated each other for their lifetime. So why did Dennis end up with a painting by Freud then, if they hated each other so much? The story that I first heard was that uh, Lucien Freud had allowed Dennis to have it, to use the reverse of the canvas to paint on, because you couldn't get canvas during the war, and it was a luxury to have the canvas. The other possibility is that it was stolen. If the painting's stolen, that could be a problem. John was told a rather mischievous story about how it may have happened. The students at Benton End were exhibiting their work in the art tent of a county fair, the Tendering Show. Lucian Freud was showing the portrait in competition with work by Dennis Worth Miller. I heard from the story that in the morning, as the sun rose and the tent was opened, that there was an empty easel where this had sat the night before. So. So hang on a minute, so while Dennis was alive, he told you two different stories as to how he might have acquired this painting. Yes. Which doesn't fill me with huge confidence, it I have to say. It doesn't. But whatever the route, what is interesting is, they were all there, as it were, at the scene of the crime. Freud was there, they knew Freud. So however the route, it's pretty exciting as a potential provenance. It is, but the route is pretty damn important. And if you've got the person who owned it, giving two different versions of how he came to acquire it. We have to look into that. Yes, there lies my problem. We've yeah. not taken on a task like this before. No, and it, yeah, it's not often that we're having to arm wrestle a dead artist who says it's not by him. The original owner of John's picture also left him a huge archive, 80 years of photos, diaries, documents and accounts. I'm going to see if there are any clues there, while Philip examines the portrait in more detail. What this artist is doing, and let's hope it's Freud, is he's latching upon an aspect of the face that appeals to him, and he's exaggerating it. He's doing what an artist does in the mid-20th century. You know, modern art at that time is so much about breaking rules. As a young man, Freud was attracted to new ideas coming from Europe experimenting with an almost grotesque style of portraiture. We know he took a particular approach to the face. He's trying to reach in and pull out a, a, a fresh and a, a, an original style of characterization that can be called Freud. How long have you been trying to get this Freud authenticated? <laughs> Since 1997, when I was given it. Did you ever feel like giving up? I've frequently given up. I, it, it, goes, it goes back in the attic, and it's, it's usually somebody else who starts it off. And the whole journey begins again. Yes. Come look at my Freud. Yes, exactly, you exactly, know. exactly. The two men at the centre of this mystery are John's friends, Dennis Worth Miller and his lifelong partner, Richard Chopping, both now dead, who were students at art school with Lucian Freud. Tell me about Dennis Worth Miller and Richard Chopping. 
They were both artists. Richard Chopping, also known as Dicky, was probably best known for the covers that he did for Ian Fleming and for the James Bond novels. And Dennisworth Miller was a painter, and a painter of, of note who was selling well in uh, the top London galleries. Dickie and Dennis mixed with some of the big names in modern art. So they were close then, Dickie and Dennis and Francis Bacon? They were incredibly close. Uh, for the last 45 years of um, Bacon's life, uh, these three spent masses of time together. And also he was friends with uh, Lucian Ford as well, but then he fell out. He was. Uh, that, that's the story of um, the normal lifetime of this group of artists. Constant rows, constant falling out, um, but uh, that was all part of the game. If this turns out to be a genuine Freud, what will you do with it? If this was authenticated, this would be the one painting that I would take to auction just to see this journey through after having spent so much time on it. Doing a valuation of the work of a 16-year-old isn't particularly easy, but actually it's a very mature-looking painting. It's got power and presence. So let's just think about that and the name of Lucian Freud. If we can attach that magical name, and the market love him at the moment, we must be talking half a million pounds, perhaps more. Throughout his career, Freud painted family and friends. The sitter in this portrait, according to John's records, was a man called John Jameson. We'll need to find out more about him. But like everything associated with this picture, evidence is hard to come by. It's a portrait with a dubious past that the artist has denied painting. Why go on? But I've been looking into the character of the artist, and I think I might be onto something. The great conundrum at the heart of this investigation is why would Freud deny a painting was by him if, in fact, he did paint it? Why would he do that? Is it because it's an early work and he's ashamed of it, doesn't want to be associated with it? And certainly in all the research I've done about Freud, it's clear that when it comes to his own work being out there, on people's walls or on the open market, he was very, very controlling. I've come across one interesting example. A still life from 1942 called Basket and Fruit that was sold as a genuine Freud in the 1970s. Yet when the painting was due to be exhibited in Israel 20 years later, trouble began. Lucian Freud stepped in and said that actually the painting had been tampered with and someone else had painted part of it and therefore he couldn't acknowledge it as a work of his own. Freud insisted that the picture be withdrawn, claiming that although the original line drawing was by him, the watercolour had been added later by another artist, a man called John Craxton, who Freud had fallen out with. The gallery that had handled the original sale didn't believe Freud and engaged in a heated exchange of letters with him. John Craxton even took a test to show that his fingerprints were not on the picture. But Freud wouldn't back down. Despite Freud's protests, when Basket and Fruit was put on the market two years later, complete with all those indignant letters, it was sold as a work by Lucian Freud anyway. Finding out the truth about our painting will be challenging. We're going to have to dig into Freud's past. Fake or Fortune specialist art researcher Dr. Ben Dor Grosvenor has come to meet the team in Soho at the French House, a regular haunt of artists and writers in post-war London. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Well, I've got to say, I think alarm bells start ringing if someone summons me to a pub and says, here's a Lucian Freud. But it's a crucial part of this murky story because it was here in this pub that Lucian Freud used to come and drink. And other artists came here. And Dickie Chopping and Dennis Worth Miller were also here from time to time. We're talking about the 1950s and 60s, and people were making alliances, they were falling out, there were jealousies, there were rivalries. We're talking about unreliable witnesses. Mm. That's part of the problem here. Yeah. Well, actually, I've got a very interesting document here which gives us a glimpse into the enmities and the hostilities that we're dealing with in that world. It's uh, written by Dickie Chopping at 4.50 a.m. one morning. He woke up and he wrote a list of reasons that he was really cross with Lucian Freud, and it, it's actually quite useful for us, I think. 
Lucian comes age 16, expelled from Branson to Benton N. His anger, this is Lucian Freud's anger, I assume, at Mr. Green's textile competition and the addition to his design. My anger, Dickie's anger, at Lucian's addition to my flower painting. This is a fantastic rant in the small hours, almost 50 years after they were at art school together. I think it's interesting that they're talking about tampering with each other's pictures and you just get a sense of how much they disliked each other. So, you know, could that explain some of the contradicting stories we've been given so far? You know, I wonder with this fabulous feud between the three of them, could Dick and Dennis just out of spite try to pass off a fake uh, and make some money out of it and embarrass him while they're at it? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'd go for the financial motive. I mean, when this picture was presented for sale in 1985, it was before Lucien Freud had had a retrospective exhibition. He wasn't making money. The estimate was two and a half to four thousand pounds. Now, if you're going to fake an artist, you're going to choose bigger game. And of course, Dickie and Dennis had original paintings by Francis Bacon that were worth far more. So why would they bother? Yeah, and also it would be an odd thing to do, wouldn't it, with the full exposure of the art world to put your fake into auction. I mean, everyone would be able to see it, discuss it, including, of course, Lucien Freud himself. This story risks being one man's word against another's. What we need is hard evidence. I'm taking the picture to Libby Sheldon, expert in the scientific analysis of paintings. So Libby, you know what we want from you. Can you help us prove that this is an early work by Lucien Freud? So what date are you looking at? So 1939 or 1940, when he's at school and he's a 16-year-old. Goodness, it's the sort of time when everybody you experimented, didn't they? The first thing for Libby to do is investigate the unusual backdrop to the portrait. There's a sort of battered, almost attacked feeling yes. to the background. And, and the suggestion of something else coming through? Yes, it certainly looks as if there's another composition, doesn't it, underneath? Um, let me turn it that way. There's these trees, aren't there? Actually, you know, when you place it like that, it's evident that we're dealing with a landscape behind, yes. with two trees, a mountain, but done the other way around. Yes. Well, that would, of course, be typical of somebody reusing a canvas is to mm -hmm. negate that, that landscape by doing that. But you'd think, in some ways, that somebody would have made more of an effort to cover it over. It has been rubbed down using white spirit or something. Libby's next step is to put the painting under the microscope, and she makes a fascinating discovery. But what's that? Actually, it looks like a hair. Is it a brush hair? Or I think it's an actual hair. It goes on into the black paint. So it's quite long. So, so not necessarily a, a paintbrush hair, but but a human hair. Human hair. How absolutely fascinating! Yeah, it does seem to be so. Quite a long hair. So. So it, it, it's, it's possible that we could have embedded in this picture a clue, a piece of DNA, perhaps. <laughs> yes, actual DNA. Um, so even if we can't get to the hand of the artist, we might be able to get to his scalp. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Bendor, meanwhile, is trying to establish who the subject of the portrait is. Tate Britain's archives hold the papers of many important artists. Bendor's hoping information found here will help to confirm evidence he's found in John's own archive. I've got here one of the key bits of evidence about our picture. It's a note in Dennis's handwriting, which apparently identifies the sitter in the portrait as someone called John Jameson. He goes on to say that a fellow student of the East Anglian School of Painting remembers the picture being painted after the fire which destroyed the school, that was July 28, 1939, and before the outbreak of war, that was September the 3rd, 1939. So really only a two-month window. At the moment, we don't know a great deal about John Jameson. We've just been told that he had two particular interests, one of which was sailors in Ipswich, and the other was black magic, which is quite a combination. 
amongst the papers of Cedric Morris, the founder of the East Anglian School of Painting, there are letters from John Jameson. And they make it very clear that not only did he know Lucian Freud quite well, he talks about meeting him on a number of occasions, but that he had been down to the East Anglian School of Painting at some point before December 1939. And it's very likely, reading the dates, that he's talking about going there in the summer of 1939. This puts Jameson in the right place at the right time. For me, I find it quite heartening because we can begin to trust some of the evidence that we've been given. I suppose what we need to do now is find a photograph to see if it really is him in our painting. My next step is to visit the place at the heart of this mystery, the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing, which was based at Benton End House in Hadley in Suffolk. I'm going with John, the owner of the picture, to try to understand the world his painting emerged from. What I love about this story is it's so full of intrigue and deception, so it seems only fitting we should go back to where it all began, which is at Benton End House, and which is where the drawing school was for 42 years. Exactly, and it's somewhere I've wanted to see ever since I knew Dickie and Dennis. But to be able to compare the old photographs and the old paintings and, and look at the studios and the barns, I can't wait to do it. Lucian Freud came to East Anglia in the summer of 1939, at the age of 16, having been expelled from his last school for disruptive behaviour. Here he found an idiosyncratic art school, where young artists were largely given a free reign to develop their own talent. So here we are in Benton End, which was like a little bubble of bohemian living in wartime Britain. Yeah. And it was run by Cedric Morris. A talented artist in his own right, Cedric Morris was perhaps the most important figure in Lucian Freud's artistic development. He's seen here painting the young Lucian. And Lucian, Dennis and Dickie, Richard Chopping yes. and Dennis Worth Miller, from whom you inherited your picture, they were all students here together, weren't they? Yes, they were the youngest three. And were Dickie and Dennis and Lucian friends while they were here? They were. They, they were very close together, but as with a lot of these people, as they get older, a lot of rivalry came into this. But they, they were definitely close at, at this stage. A world away from drab, wartime Britain and rationing, there were long lunches of exotic Mediterranean food and wine, and a constant stream of visitors. You can see in this photograph, uh, Lucien Freud's wearing a fez. I think the, the outfits worn by the people here were pretty outlandish, and outlandish for their time. The young artists cast aside the usual collar and tie and wore open necked shirts and cravats, exactly like the subject of our painting. The relaxed atmosphere meant there was very little record keeping that might help support our picture's authenticity. But John has one piece of evidence which again links the man we believe to be the sitter to Benton End. This record you've got from your archive of, of Dickie and Dennis's, this is a brief moment when someone was actually keeping a record. That's true. <laughs> and and what did. does it show us about who was here? This was um, from 1941 and um, they kept these records, Dickie and Dennis kept these records, and it shows who came as guests here, who was here as students and shows us what money the people put in. So very importantly in, yeah. so this was contributing to the, the financial upkeep of the household, yes. Lucian. Yeah. And that can only be Lucian Freud. Yep. Then we've got Cedric and fascinatingly John Jameson. So that is a very important document for me. It's another confirmation that John Jameson, the man we believe is the subject of the painting, visited Benton End when Lucian was there. Ben Dawes' next job is to prove or disprove the stories about how Dickie and Dennis got the picture. If it was given to them by Lucian or found by them at the art school, there won't have been a paper trail. But in the Suffolk County Records Office, Ben Dawes can check out the story about the painting being stolen from an art tent. I'm trying to chase down one of the stories we've been told about where our painting comes from. Apparently, it was... Uh, put into an art tent in a village fete in a place called Tendering in 1939. And just at the moment when the 
tent was about to open, the artist went in and discovered that Lucien Freud's painting was missing. The tendering show did not run at all between 1932 and 1946. So if there was an art tent, it must have been at another show in 1939 or 40. The local papers are rather detailed about every aspect of these thrilling events. At the St John's fate here, we learn that they had a darts competition and even something called a pig rolling competition, which was won by a lady called Mrs Death and frankly the mind boggles. However, I've been going through the whole of 1939 and I cannot find a single mention of anything like an art tent. And worse still, for 1940, after the war has broken out, all these events stop completely. So I'm led to conclude that unfortunately the story about a painting coming from an art tent is not true. The alternatives, I suppose, is that Lucian Freud somehow gave the picture to someone else, possibly for reuse, or that the painting was taken from some other place, maybe from Benton End itself. However, the alarming possibility now arises that if this story is fake, then maybe the picture is also fake. Given the lack of evidence, it seems unlikely that we'll ever be able to find out how Dickie and Dennis came by the painting. Perhaps our best course of action now is to focus our attention on the canvas itself. I've been doing a little research and I've tracked down a genuine Freud painted in 1940, just a year after our own picture. The National Museum of Wales in Cardiff have agreed to let us put both portraits side by side for a direct comparison, under the watchful eye of the museum's curator of modern art, Nick Thornton. So this is a portrait by Lucien Freud when he was 17 years old of the man who taught him at the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing, Cedric Morris. Yeah, it's painted by Freud in 1940 when he was still a pupil at the East Anglia School of Painting and Drawing. Seeing them sitting next to each other, it's fascinating immediately to, to settle upon the brush strokes. And there seems to be a slightly hesitant, almost sort of neurotic way with little stabs of the brush uh, that you see the contours of the face described. And I can see it in the forehead of the Lucian Freud of Cedric and our possible Lucian Freud as well. Absolutely. I think the interesting thing that, that this looks um, more immediate, slightly more naive than our work, but there's, uh, there are interesting comparisons in terms of the choice of colour. They're kind of almost mixing colours across the face to create form and tone. Let's just think about the face for the moment, because there's something to do with the asymmetry, the, 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 the sort of the willful bending of the nose and the placing of the mouth slightly off centre that I can see as a feature shared by both. Absolutely. I mean, one thing that Freud learned from Morris at this time was uh, creating a sort of psychological intensity within with the relationship with the sitter. And often he did that by kind of exaggerating certain features, that they almost borders on caricature. And if our painting is going to be by Lucien Freud, it's probably going to be a year before this. If it was by Lucien Freud, would be a painting by a teenager. So if there is some tentativeness around it, that's something that perhaps you would expect. I'm so pleased we've, we've done this. We have compared our picture now to a known Lucian Freud that he did when he was 17 years old. A and to my mind, there are unquestionably characteristics, similarities, not just the, the, the characterization that edgy, slightly unsettling way that the face is done, but also the technique, the, 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 the little sort of giveaway traits that of course come from Cedric Morris, the subject of the picture. So that's great. It takes us to where we want to be, to the person who's influencing him. But of course, there's a whole load of other students there at the same time, you know, 15 or thereabouts, all of whom are going to be picking up on this style. So. We're certainly getting closer, but we've got further to go. We're beginning to understand the world our picture came from. Now we're meeting at Philip's gallery to see if we can take the next step and link the portrait directly to Lucian Freud himself. Hi, Benjamin. Hi. Now, 
Our early provenance, I don't think, is looking very good. The county fair story, well, I just can't make it work. I don't think it's true at all. And the other stories, well, even if they are true, they're not going to give us a paper trail, so we've got nothing tangible to go with. Well, let's just remind ourselves what those other theories were. Either Freud gave Dennis the painting so that Dennis could reuse it, you reuse the canvas when they're at the East Anglian School of Painting drawing together, or uh, Freud left it lying around and Dennis picked it up. And certainly, having been there and seen the rather chaotic way in which people worked, I think it's very plausible. I mean, look at this picture here of Cedric Morris at Benton End. The, you know, the canvas is just left stacked against the wall. So it's certainly I could imagine that Dennis picked it up possibly from the old barn. Yes, and I've come across accounts from other students who just say they left their artwork behind. But have a look at this. This is another early picture by Lucien Freud. In fact, it shows uh, Dickie chopping. And we know that this picture was left at Benton until at least the 1970s. See, that's another useful stylistic addition to our body of work in which I think our painting fits. Now, if you put the two together, immediately you see what I think is a really compelling comparison. I mean, both lapels are you know, rather floppy and sort of organic looking. And the eyes, they're so specific, aren't they? They're both pencil sharp and those highly sort of artificial looking drawn in eyebrows above. I've got a drawing here from Freud's sketchbook of 1939-40, so about the time we think our picture was made. And I think if you compare it to our picture, you can see the way Freud has sort of inserted these almost willful distortions in the face. And I guess what Freud is looking for here in representing this sitter, whoever it may be, is the features that really struck him. So his eyebrows, the hair, the slightly lopsided mouth. I mean, it would be fascinating if we managed to find a photograph of that chap, if those are the things that really stand out. So stylistically, I think this picture is stacking up more and more. Now, when I was with Libby, I came across in the paint, can you believe it, a human hair. And look at that, clear as day. Now, if we can get DNA from it, it's not impossible that we can prove that it's Lucian Freud's. I mean, that would be an astonishing piece of evidence for us. John has given Libby permission to remove the hair from the picture. It's being rushed to King's College London, whose forensic science lab regularly works with the Metropolitan Police. This job is a touch unusual for expert in DNA identification, Dr Denise Syndicum Court. So, Denise, we have a particular challenge. We found in the picture that we hope to be by Lucian Freud a hair. Now, it could well be a human hair, and is it possible for us to extract DNA? Well, first of all, we've got to make sure that we can get some reliable DNA out of it. And once that, then we need something or somebody to compare it with. Somebody who is either Lucian Freud and I guess he's not around, um, or somebody who is related to him. Hair contains a particular form of DNA which is only passed from mother to child. This means Freud's own children are no use for this test, but we've tracked down his mother's sister's daughter and she's agreed to give us a sample of her DNA. If the hair in our picture belonged to Lucian Freud, she should provide an exact match. So even if the hair has been encased in paint for what could be 80 years, we can still get at the DNA? Well, actually, the fact that it's been stuck on a painting might actually preserve it, because it stops it, uh, stops the light getting to it, stops, stops moisture getting to it. All these things preserve the hair and preserve the DNA in the hair. At the scene of a crime, hair is a poor source of DNA. Even with the most up-to-date techniques, it's not always possible to extract a meaningful sample. The painstaking process will take at least four days. But if the result brings our picture closer to Lucien Freud, it's worth the wait. I'm in search of someone who spoke directly to Lucien Freud about John's picture and I've managed to persuade Lucien's daughter, Rose Boyt, to give us an interview. It's an important opportunity as we understand she knows of John's picture and may have discussed it with her father. 
When did you first see the painting? I first saw the painting in 2006. John showed me the painting and then um, at that time I felt very strongly that I didn't want to take the painting round to my father's. I felt that if I did take it round there, he would probably put his fist through it. Or he'd put his fist through it, why? Because he hated the intrusion of people saying, did you do this and didn't you do it? And I felt that if he hadn't identified it in the normal course of things, that that meant that he didn't want to, that and the reason he didn't want to was probably because either because it was stolen or that it wasn't by him or that he hated it. I can completely understand that if you did something you didn't think was good, you wouldn't want anyone to see it. You certainly wouldn't want to sell it. You wouldn't want to put it to be in a museum. So you didn't take it no, to I show to your father? No, you didn't dare by the sounds of it. I, and, and it then, wasn't that I didn't dare. It's just I, d I thought the painting would, he would destroy the painting. Whether it was by him or not, I thought he would destroy it. And then I'd have to say to John, oh, you know you're Lucian Freud, it is no more. So did your father ever talk about Dickie and Dennis? He didn't like them for, for reasons of his own. But my father did used to enjoy disliking people. So that's not necessarily... He liked a good feud. Well, not necessarily a feud, but just you, you, he would have a, have a reaction to certain people and some people he just wouldn't be able to stand. Tell me how your father would um, go to some pains to ensure that the work that he liked would be in the public domain, but work that he didn't might perhaps not be. He would have a destroying his paintings that he didn't like or wasn't going to finish session so he might get one of my brothers to go around to the studio and spend um, six or seven hours destroying paintings that he didn't feel were working so that would be a very good and clear way of editing his work so revealing talking to Lucian Freud's daughter Rose there. I mean, she's given us plenty of reasons why he might have turned this painting down. He clearly loathed Dickie and Dennis. He was very controlling about his output and what left his studio. She told me that as well. But that's all speculation. I need to know, if it is by Freud, why did he reject it? This painting has been bouncing around the art world for more than 30 years, so I think it stands to reason that Freud would have been approached about this work more than once in that time. Someone must have spoken directly to him about it. And I need to find whoever that person was and speak to him or her directly myself. While Fiona goes in search of Freud's first-hand testimony, I'm hoping science can give us a direct link between the artist and John's painting. The results of the DNA tests are in, so John and I are off to see Denise Syndicum Court. Well, so far, John, as you know, we've got nothing that physically connects this painting to Lucien Freud. My first question to you, therefore, Denise, is have we managed to extract some DNA? From the painting? From the hair on the painting, yes. From the hair on the painting. So the next question, I suppose, is have you managed to narrow that down? Yes, we have. Well, the good quality DNA from that has given us a, a group that we can place that maternal origin into. And have you been able to compare that group with the swab that was taken from the female relation of Lucien Freud? Yes, we have. It was, a, was it a human hair? It was a human hair. That's my Jack Russell out of the equation. <laughs> Good. And what was the result? Well, we got uh, a particular type from Lucien Freud's maternal relative but it doesn't match with the sample from the painting, unfortunately. How do you feel, John? Well, it's one step forward, one step backwards. So as much as we'd love it to be so, it's not Lucian Freud's. Well, we I'm have... so sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. It's but, fascinating uh, to have done it. It's absolutely yeah. amazing to have done it. Yeah. Oh, well, we're going to have to go back to other things. Back to the drawing board. I'm still trying to find someone who spoke directly to Lucian Freud about John's painting. And finally, I've had a breakthrough. It seems an auction house may have consulted Freud about our picture just five years before his death. 
I've been looking into the most recent occasion Lucian Freud was shown our painting, and it appears to have been 2006. Now, he was an artist who guarded his privacy jealously. You didn't just ring him up about a picture. Everything had to go through a third party. And back in 2006, that third party was his solicitor, Diana Rostron, and she works here. And if anyone would have discussed our painting with Lucian Freud, it would have been her. Diana has ordered her 2006 files from the archive. Could they hold the answer? Right. That looks intriguing. Now, Diana, you have worked as a solicitor for Freud um, while he was alive for many years. How often would you be talking to him then? I should think I spoke to him nearly every working day and occasionally at weekends. And what was he like to deal with? He was delightful. He was very polite, courteous. He was phenomenally intelligent. Did you um, ever discuss our painting with him? Yes, he telephoned. These are my files for 2006 for everything I did, but I had a fairly good idea it would be on this general file. And you made notes of the telephone conversation, and this was you? Well, a, a scribbled note. I'd have written it better if I thought it was going to be on a television programme. But it was just for my purposes. So the next day... Here we go. 6th of April, L.F. Lucien Freud. Started by him, but someone has completed. But hang on, he's saying it is partly by him. Yes. Well, this is, I have to say, this is a massive breakthrough for us. Because so far, all we've had is Lucian Freud saying it's not by him. Uh, or, or, or his daughter not even really wanting to present it to him because she was no. so worried what his response would be. But here we have, as close to from the horse's mouth as we can get, that he's saying he did, he did at least start it. Yes. Shirt, you have to help me Shirt, here with this. Body, Shirt, body, neck by LF. By Lucian Freud. And, and part of head. But he has actually done part of this painting. I think the main thing was he knew it had been started by him, but he was sort of speculating a bit about which bits he might have done. And, and in terms of who finished it? No. No information he, about that? No, he didn't make a comment about that. I don't think you can take this as definitive. And I think you should bear in mind that he's looking at this painting how many years later? Mm. 65 years later, mm. I think. Just out of interest, why, when you replied to Christie's about whether Freud painted this or not, you just said, I regret he is not able to authenticate the work as by him. Why did you phrase it in that way rather than saying, he says he painted part of it but not all of it? And uh, he, he didn't want that said. I mean, he just, if, if they weren't by him, they weren't by him. So partly by him wasn't good enough. It was either all by him or not at either all. Either all by him or not at all. Philip, well, I have some rather interesting news for you, what I think is a real breakthrough for us. I'm at the um, offices of Lucian Ford's former solicitor, and what she said is he painted some of it. He started the painting, but he didn't finish it. So we have that then from the man himself? We have it from the man himself via his solicitor and her contemporaneous notes. That's a transformative nugget of information we've just got. It is. It has just taken us such a massive step forward. Oh, it's a triumph. I'm very mindful, though, Philip, although this is Freud musing about a painting decades after it was done. So I'm wondering if maybe he could have painted a little bit less than is written in this note, maybe a little bit more. It should be possible to analyse the picture now and see whether or not there are different campaigns by different hands. Well, that sounds like just what we need. Bendor has a breakthrough of his own. He and John are on the trail of the possible subject of the painting, John Jameson. Using clues from Jameson's letters, we've managed to identify his old school as Winchester College, and it seems they may have photographs. So, John, I think looking at Freud's picture, if it is by Lucien Freud, it's difficult to judge a likeness from it, isn't it? I mean, in, in terms of a conventional portrait. But yes. there are certain aspects of the, of the face that I think we can assume that Freud featured because they struck him. So the slightly tilted mouth, the piercing eyes, We've got the hairstyle is quite good to focus on, so we've got a little yeah. side parting there and the hint of a widow's peak and sort of dense curly hair. Long face. Mm, slightly longer face, yes. So I've got some photographs here of Jameson when he was here from 1933. The 
year he left, so... If I... I'm sorry to test you like this, but it's probably quite a good exercise. If I cover up the names... You need glasses for this. Because that'll be a good... Three. That'll be a good test as to whether... Actually, we're, we're spotting a likeness. See if you can... See if anyone in this photograph strikes you as the sitter in your portrait. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this is the multi-million dollar. Choose which one. I think I might... I think I'm going to go there. Have I got it? No. I'm not joking, that's him. No! Yeah. <laughs> that's extraordinary. There are definite details that match here. Eyes close together and those distinctive brows. The long nose and prominent ears, the off-centre mouth with the slight upward kink on the left, plus the thick hair with the side parting. What you've done here is actually, I'm really pleased about that. Extraordinary. I think it's a really valid demonstration because these are the features that Freud has picked up on and they've translated into that picture. But what it really fascinates me about that as well is that um, so many people over the 20 years that I've owned this painting saying, well, it's not a very good portrait, is it? Mm. Well, it must be. It must be, exactly. <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's such a telling point. And Freud, as we know, was actually a brilliant portraitist. And, and that point of the, a very um, early, uh, precocious talent yes. at portraiture. It, it's got to be him, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm knocked out by that. I really am. It's incredible. Good. Good. This suddenly seems a more accomplished portrait than we thought. Building on Freud's own admission via his solicitor, I think we can go further and argue that more of the figure of Jameson is in fact by Lucian Freud. I'm heading back to see Libby Sheldon. Can her scientific analysis help us to understand which parts Freud painted and which, if any, he did not? OK, Libby. The stakes are really getting higher. We have recorded the words of the artist himself when he was alive, that the body, the shirt, the neck, and a part of the face is actually by him. Now, the question is, can we determine what the artist did and what someone else might have done? The neck, what does he mean by that? Because. I mean, that's a good point. Is he, is he, is he incorporating the skin up here, or is it just this uh, cravat? Interestingly enough, this, this, is, this is one point which I've been looking at, and, and you can see um, that the white and the black, or blackish blue, of the scarf is very well integrated yes, with, so, with so, white. So, so in, other, in other words, the shirt, the wet paint of the shirt is going into the wet paint uh, of the scarf. Yes, there's absolutely no time difference. I wouldn't say that this is put on top. So I suppose the big question, therefore, is can we find something similar to the treatment of that scarf in the face? It's interesting because this and this black hair and this browny black of the hair are very closely related physically in terms of the pigment makeup um, and the manner in which they've been applied. Libby believes that if Freud painted the cravat, he also painted the hair. And her pigment analysis can help link other parts of the head to Freud. The white of the shirt and the forehead are the same pigment, and we know he painted the shirt. These areas of mixed pink and yellow match up and feature the same distinctive brushwork. The way the black and the white paint of the eyes is worked in with the surrounding skin shows they couldn't have been added later. Lastly, the paint over most of the face is a consistent one layer thick, making it highly unlikely that a later hand completed it. He's actually painted it using the underlying man landscape. So you see this green here, that just goes under the red of the lip. Actually, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because it shows it's not an unfinished picture. The artist is trying to use the scraped down background with the landscape showing through as part of the overall composition. I don't think he, he minded that landscape. I think he, he was making the most of it. OK, so everything you point out seems to suggest that this painting came together in, in, in one thought process, in one campaign. 
Absolutely, I, I, I don't have any hesitation really in saying that the links all over the painting really tie it in to, to a single artist. It would be very surprising if somebody else took up exactly the same uh, way of using the brush, exactly the same range of pigments, you, applying them in the same way. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that it's a single hand. Armed with Libby's scientific findings and the note from Freud's lawyer, we've come as far as we can. We've persuaded three leading authorities on Freud's work to now give their verdict on our picture. James Kirkman was Freud's art dealer for 30 years. Art critic William Fever is Freud's biographer and was a close friend. And Toby Treves is currently compiling the catalogue resume, a complete list of Freud's authentic work. While we're confident of our evidence, it's quite another thing to ask three experts to put their reputations on the line and go against the opinion of the artist himself. This is not the usual fake or fortune verdict, because normally when we find ourselves before a panel of august experts such as yourselves, we're asking, is the painting by a particular artist? But we already know, through Lucian Freud, from a conversation he had with his solicitor, that he painted at least the shirt, the body, the neck, and part of the head. That much we already know. So, gentlemen, the opinion of you three combined will be extraordinarily important in relation to this picture. In fact, it will be make or break. Now, the more we've looked into it, the more we consider this whole work to be by Lucien Freud, but that is our view. We now need yours. We need to ask you the question, can we call this, can we baptise it, a work by Lucien Freud? I think one thing we've got to ask ourselves is why Lucien was unhappy about the picture, why he has apparently rejected it. Every artist is unhappy with certain pictures that they've done, particularly what you've done when you were at school. I think being a schoolboy, basically, he just put it down at the end of the day and went on to something else later. But does he think it's finished? If we're looking at this as a finished painting, um, it's hard to argue that the landscape itself uh, is anything we've seen in any other Freud painting. Mm. I think it was a schoolboy's early attempt at a portrait, and it works pretty well in those respects, I think. Yeah, I think it's good. Except for the cravat. The cravat is awful. It's not finished. <laughs> it's time for the experts to reach their verdict. Behind closed doors. We're hoping that the combination of Libby's evidence, a single hand at work on the painting, and Freud's own admission that he at least started it, will be enough. When we found that note, kept by Freud's solicitor, in which he said that he had painted part of this painting. It felt like the smoking gun. But as it turns out, the truth is much more complicated than that, as ever, with this picture. I mean, what a test. Are they going to be able to say, after an artist has said it's not by him entirely, that it is? It's frankly a real conundrum. Hi, John. After much deliberation, a verdict has been reached. It's time to tell John whether or not he's the owner of a half million pound Lucian Freud. Well, it's quite a while since we've all been together here with you and your painting. True. How are you feeling? Uh, I think after 19 years, I can well and truly say uh, uh, very, very apprehensive. Well, it's become more interesting since we last met. Right. I had a conversation with Lucian Freud's lawyer. Diana Rostrum. As far as you knew, Lucian Freud had denied that this painting was by him. That's right, yeah. She asked him about your picture. Freud said he did paint part of this picture. Now, that's what he said in 2006. The fact that this was on Lucian Freud's radar, that he spoke to his lawyer about it, is absolutely incomprehensible to me. So this was a massive breakthrough. <laughs> Unbelievable. And I have to say, We've analysed this picture really carefully. And personally, I'm entirely satisfied that it is by Lucien Freud. So that was the moment where we decided to convene a body of experts. And they discussed it and have some reactions. It's in here. This, this after 19 years, is just 
sort of happening in slow motion to me at the moment. So this is from the three of them. We believe this to be a work Lucian Freud did at art school, most probably in 1939. There is a split decision regarding the landscape and the majority believe that it is part of the original painting. OK, so, how, so with my head still spinning, it, it, it begs just one big question from me. And forgive me if I'm being thick. Is it or isn't it a Freud then? Well, the thing is, what you had was door slamming in your face for exactly. 19 years. Exactly. What you've got now is you've got three of the most august experts Absolutely. pronouncing on this painting. And you've got two who are happy to say, William Fever and James Kirkman, it's a Freud. Toby Treves, the more cautious voice, is preparing the catalogue raisonné. He concedes the figure is probably by Freud, but argues that it can't be put into the full catalogue because he feels the picture is unfinished and the landscape behind not intended to be seen. So on current evidence, he would only include the picture in the appendix, but it would still have considerable appeal. I can confidently say that this work is worth two to three hundred thousand pounds because of the mixed response, and quite possibly more. It is by Lucien Freud, but the question is, how much is by him? And that's a nice problem to have at this stage. Wow. Wow. Well, I, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I, I'm kind of speechless because, I mean, it's just been, uh, as you know, standing here a few minutes ago, not knowing which way this was going to go. But it, it's just extraordinary that, that you've got it, it, you've discovered this. I mean, it's just extraordinary that that's come out of it. You happy? With thank that you result? so much. Well, thank you very much. I'm, yeah, I'm delighted. I mean, amazing. It's just, uh, I, I just kind of feel um, also that I wasn't mad. It's just when I just look here, you know, I'm close to it, the lights, and just seeing the colours and the paint build up and things like that, I wasn't mad. Well, I don't know about you, but I think that's a result. I think it is. And also, we broke a new ground. I mean, never before have we had to prove that a picture is by an artist who has denied it. Mm. Not any old artist, but one of the great figures of British art in the 20th century. Yeah, and of course it's a reminder that this game isn't cut and dry, is it? Attribution is a human process. It's about different shades of response. And let's look at what we've got. We have a painting that is either by Lucien Freud now or largely by him. And John couldn't be happier. If you think you have an undiscovered masterpiece or other precious object, we'd love to hear from you at bbc.co.uk slash fake or fortune.